My name is Brandy Fields, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of all of my colleagues here at Whittier Trust. Thank you for giving up your evening to be with us. I think you're going to find our speaker is going to engage with you on topics that um, are top of mind for everyone. He's going to do a good comparison from 1920 till now. He's a uh, Forbes publish, former publisher and editor at large. He is a futurist and writer of the Tech Connector column for Forbes Asia. He's a regular speaker and panel monitor at business and financial events around the world. Recently, he was on the Forbes Investor Cruise in August, and he led the Forbes Global CEO Conference, and he gave the same speech to our friends in Reno. So we um, got a preview of what you're going to hear tonight, and I think you're going to be impressed. Rich has written five books, and I just learned at dinner that he once ran like 52 miles. So... If anyone needs um, guidance on how to run for seven hours straight, Rich is your guy. Um, so anyway, as a publisher of, or writer of five books, we've had the honor of working with Rich since 2014. He came and spoke about his first book, which was titled Soft Edge. Then we had him back to um, Orange County in 2019 for his book titled Late Bloomers. And uh, that book was favorably reviewed by NPR, Harvard Business Review, and the Wall Street Journal. The Financial Times chose Late, Bo Late Bloomers as one of its most read 2020 books. The Wall Street Journal selected Late Boomers for its C-suite book club. So Rich has co-founded three companies and is on advisory boards of the Forbes School of Business and Technology at the University of Arizona Global Campus. He holds a BA in Political Science from Stanford University. He and his family, his lovely wife, has joined him here this evening. They reside in Silicon Valley. He's a past winner of the Northern California E&Y Entrepreneur of the Year Award. But again, I just want to thank you, Rich, for coming and have, having um, a great partnership with us. You've provided great guidance to us um, on the editorial side, how he taught us what a listicle is. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but he said articles that have a list are going to be more widely um, read. So thank you, Rich, and um, welcome. Uh, thank you, Brandy, for that gracious introduction. Um, could I have my wife, Margie, and uh, Karen McCarthy stand up, please? No. Uh, ha have you ever seen two people that look almost like identical twins? <laughs> yeah. So... Um, well, thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for having me. It's really a delight to be with my friends at Whittier Trust, and and uh, everything that I'm going to say tonight, I say from the point of view as an observer. I'm a really lucky person that I work at Forbes, and I get to see a lot of things and talk to a lot of people. And but the real experts are in the room. They work for a company called Whittier Trust. So as I give my talk tonight, this is what I said. Uh, when I talked in Reno uh, for What Are Your Trusts back in August, think about, you know, uh, it, it, on Forbes Investor Cruises, we, we recommend that, number one, you put your money with the people who really know what to do. And uh, there's no firm west of the Mississippi better than What Are Your Trusts for that. But it's also a good, useful exercise to maybe allocate 2%, 3%, 5%, whatever number you choose, to self-manage it because you'll learn a lot. And at the very least, you'll have, uh, it'll equip you to have interesting conversations with your wittier advisors. But for me, there is no better way to keep up with uh, US and global events than through the lens of the financial and investment community. So I, I'm, I'm here to speak to that 2%, not the 98% that you wisely uh, let Whittier Trust have. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the, uh, the question that I'm going to talk about tonight. The 2020s were, you know, we're, we're almost a fifth of the way through them. Uh, will it, does this decade still have any possibility of roaring in the way that we think the 1920s roared? Or has it gotten off to such a god-awful start 
with the pandemic and screwed up politics and aggressive Russian posturing and the China's 20th Party Congress and, and all, of, all of the events going around in the world today, um, does it have any possibility of finding its sea legs and being a really good economic and investment decade? Or is the better comparison the 1970s, which um, certainly was better than the 1860s in the United States, but, but it really wasn't a great economic decade at all. It was a politically screwed up decade, as you'll recall. And so I want to work through these issues, and I don't promise any answers here, but I'll make some observations along the way. Um, why listen to me? Well, uh, I, I'm lucky to be a representative of Forbes. I celebrated my 30th year at Forbes in, in July. That's a long time in the media business. I was publisher of Forbes from 1998 to 2018, and so on and so forth. So you all know what Forbes is, but for me, it's really been a great perch um, to uh, observe what's going on in the world and to talk to people. It's a great license to be able to pick up the phone or send somebody an email, and generally, because you're Forbes, people get back. Uh, Brandy alluded to some of my books. This is a book on corporate culture that I published in 2014. That was a book I co-wrote with another author on great high-performance teams within cultures. Uh, Satya Dandela, of the CEO of Microsoft, was kind enough to blurb it. Um, and then I wrote a book on uh, uh, late bloomers that I will uh, might touch on in the end. But I spoke to some of you, some of you heard my uh, talk on late bloomers in a previous conference. And then just a couple of other things, the Forbes investor cruise was in August in the Baltic. Um, really interesting things learned there. And then that was the Forbes CEO conference in Singapore. And I'm seated next to him in the big photo and then down on the bottom left is the finance minister of Singapore, Lawrence Wong, who is the prime minister in waiting and 99% um, probability he will succeed Lee Shang Loon, who is the son of Lee Kuan Yew, um, who has been running Singapore masterfully uh, for, for several decades, the, uh, Lee Kuan Yew and his son. Okay, the 1920s. Uh, remember, it is the roaring 1920s. It actually got off to a lousy start, a terrible start before it boomed in the way that we remember from history, the way the 1920s boomed. How lousy a start? Well, the Spanish flu caused 50 million deaths globally, and it wasn't over in 1918. It just appeared in 1918 and was identified, but it lingered on through 1919, 1920, a little bit in 1921. So the whole decade began with the worst pandemic uh, the world had ever seen. We had, as a result of um, the wind down of World War I, we had double-digit inflation in 1920 and 21. Now, deflation is, in many ways, it's worse than inflation because in deflation, you're always waiting around for prices to get cheaper. And if you couldn't think of a better formula to paralyze people's spending habits and, and, and both business spending and consumer spending, then for prices to drop. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Certainly, the computer field, the cell phone field sort of works that way. But it was really kind of a shock. You had a farm labor exodus. You had tractors. You had uh, new farm machinery that ran on internal combustion engines instead of horse-drawn plows. And that created uh, we, you know, a, a huge superfluous labor force. When we started the 20th century, 45% of adult Americans worked on farms. And that kind of continued. And then suddenly in the 1920s, farm labor was decimated. What, what did all those suddenly unemployed farmers do? They moved to cities and they crowded into cities. So uh, we had a lot of uh, cities were, were really pretty uh, lousy places back in the 1920s. You know, the, the, the hazy lens of history, you know, looking at the glamour of the 1920s and flappers and, and uh, speakeasies and all of that kind of stuff, notwithstanding. A lot of crime, a lot of unemployment, a lot of dirt, uh, cities were overcrowded. You had an 18-month mini depression from 20 and 21, the result of this double-digit deflation. And stocks dropped in the first 18 months of that decade, the decade we remember for stock booms, they dropped 47%, about the same as what they dropped in 
from um, the fall of 2008 through the spring of 2009, actually a little more in the 08 and 09. But that's how the 20s started. You know, this great booming decade started about as poorly as you could imagine. And then finally, the, the, the problems started clearing up and you had a new world. You had really the birth of the modern happened in the 1920s. The United States went from being a rural nation to a citified nation very rapidly in the 1920s was the pivot point of that historical movement. We had widespread electrification. We had, um, it was the first, <laughs> believe it or not, in the 1920s is when more Americans had indoor plumbing than not. That happened in the 1920s. You had uh, robots at the time, they were called washing machines. Um, that did the work that human beings used to do. You had a skyscraper boom. Skyscrapers weren't, didn't appear for the first time in the 1920s, but you had a boom of skyscrapers. The Empire State Building was completed, I think, in 1931, but it was conceived and financed during the boom years of the 1920s, same with the Chrysler Building in New York. So a boom in buildings over 40 or 45 stories, or however the definition of a skyscraper was then, they suddenly went from curiosities to ubiquity in cities like New York. Speaking of ubiquity, from the beginning of the 1920s through the end of the 1920s, you had a 30-fold increase in the number of automobiles in the United States. Radios and newspapers boomed. Uh, cities like New York and Los Angeles had multiple daily newspapers that came out multiple times a day. The fact that you had radio and newspapers meant that you had popular culture heroes uh, for the first time. You had Babe Ruth in baseball. You had Jack Dempsey in boxing. Um, you had um, you know, all kinds of my good friend Jeff Prater. Was it uh, uh, Bill Tilden in tennis? Bill Tilden in tennis, you had all of these sort of popular culture heroes that suddenly had a national, not just a local or a regional audience. Uh, and you had urban lifestyles. You know, the, uh, pe probably people in this room, people of a certain age like me or, or maybe older, probably think we invented sex. And it was the decade of the 1960s where we invented sex. You know, so we thought, right? The 1920s is when we invented sex, uh, the way that sex is known uh, and thought of today. So urban lifestyles, that whole degree of licentiousness happened in the 1920s. So it was really kind of the birth of, of the old rural grip on the United States, this continental nation, into the recognition that cities were really important uh, places. Stocks in the 1920s, you can see, um, started out and immediately dove 47%. And once they hit the bottom, in mid-1921, then they went up in the 1920s, the rest of the decade, you remember, until the very end, <laughs> until the very end um, went up and up and up and up. Now, the very end actually didn't start in October 1929. It started in August 1929, where stocks started drifting down and then went over a cliff in October 1929 and continued all the way down until June 1932 when the total devastation to U.S. stocks is about 89 or 90 percent, depending how you measure. Sadiq probably has real accurate figures on that. But that mainly that happened, it started in the 1920s, uh, but it really hit bottom in the early part of the 1930s. And you can see just how, uh, you know, when you look at stocks from 1920 to 1940, you really get sort of the perspective of it, how far stocks went up in the 1920s and how far they went down in the 1930s very, very rapidly. Um, you even had, uh, you know, stocks made somewhat of a recovery, an impressive one, in 1936, and then in 1937, slam, bam, um, they went down, uh, they went down again, and really didn't come out of the funk until uh, World War II, until the U.S. got into World War II, the result of, of Pearl, Pearl Harbor and Hitler's aggression in Europe. So that was the 1920s. You know, it was, we still think of the 1920s as this booming decade, and it was a booming decade. We had stock market boom, we had stock market excesses. Uh, it was the decade where Joe Kennedy, you know, John F. Kennedy's father got out of the stock market famously because shoeshine boys were giving stock tips. Um, so when shoeshine boy, we don't have shoeshine boy. I think I killed the shoeshine 
industry single-handedly with my sneakers. But the decade started out very poorly, then really boomed, and not until the end um, did people recognize the excesses. Now the 1970s, 50 years ago, um, that actually, you know, it's kind of a, uh, I guess if you're a hardcore heavy metal rock and roll fan, it was a good decade, but it was a bad decade in many respects, certainly in financial assets. But it had a good start, unlike the 1920s is sort of the mirror image. It had a good start and then it petered out. Um, you had the 1970 to 1972 bull market. Now it wasn't a bull market um, the way the 1920s were a bull market, either in the scope of it or the length of it. But it started out, uh, it started out pretty good. Um, that was the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, and you see that it went up. I mean, 70 to 73, that's not going to set any world records, but who would, you're not going to walk away from that uh, in your portfolio if you get those kind of returns over a three-year period. And then by the end of the decade, things were barely ahead of where they started in that decade. It was actually the Dow would go, would hit a bottom of below 600 in um, August 1982. So um, it went, uh, the, you know, the, the, the trends at the most of the 70s set forth were not good. Here are some of the things that happened in the 1970s. We had a recession in 1970s, the first oil embargo uh, from the Middle East in 73. Politics were screwed up. You think they're screwed up today? They were screwed up then too. 73, Vice President Agnew resigned. 74, uh, yeah, after Agnew resigned, people said, what could top that? <laughs> um, well, uh, President Nixon topped that in 74. You have the 73 to 75, Recession, stocks dropped again, you know, almost 50%. Um, national pride was dealt a huge blow with the fall of Saigon in 1975, 79. You had the oil embargo number two, and then inflation really started kicking in. And then you had uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, unfortunately timed speech in the summer of 1979. The historians have called the Malays speech. He never used the word Malays in the Malays speech. It was a Boston Globe who gave it the title that it was such a lackluster speech and didn't seem to have, you know, we need to all pull ourselves together. Um, it just didn't seem like a, a, a presidential speech. And by that time, Carter, who personally, personally was a likable guy, was no longer likable at the presidential level. So this is what you had during the 1970s. And yet still a new world was born. I mean, this is one of the crummiest economic decades, not, not as bad as the 1930s. Uh, and, and politically, you know, and in terms of uh, threat to civilization in America, not like the 1860s. But it was a, overall kind of a crummy decade. And still you had this amazing entrepreneurial boom that was happening beneath the radar. You know, there weren't magazines around to really cover it, uh, like Inc. and some smaller business magazines that came along at the end of the decade, but you had the birth of FedEx that changed shipping entirely. You had um, the birth of Apple and Microsoft and Oracle. Well, look at Apple and Microsoft. They're still the most valuable two companies on the face of the earth, I mean, not including Saudi Aramco. I'm talking about public. Saudi Aramco is a public company, but what, it's got a 2% float or something like that. I don't really regard it as, and I don't even know, it, I, it's worth less than Apple and Microsoft. But think about the two big winners in the you know, the stock market today, where they were born in the 1970s. The Intel microprocessor was released in November 1971, which gave birth to personal calculators, personal computers. The biotech revolution started in the late 70s with Genentech. And then you had, um, you, you sort of had this, um, the birth of single interest magazines and, and single interest sports and things like that. Uh, Tom Wolf, the great writer Tom Wolf called the 70s the me decade. Well, this is the commercialization of the me decade. Running companies, uh, running shoes like Nike, which was a mail order company called Blue Ribbon Sports out of the Portland suburbs, started in the 60s, but it came Nike in the early 1970s. You had specialized bicycles and Trek bicycles, still the two dominant high-end bicycle companies in the United States, started in the 1970s. You had Starbucks in the... So a lot of lifestyle companies were started in this crummy decade. So the 1920s, lousy start, um, what? Are we going to look more like the 1920s or are we going to look more like the 1970s? Most people today, if 
for, you know, if you had to give an answer to that question, would probably say the 70s because it's the 20s have kind of gotten off to a shaky start, wouldn't you say? I mean, COVID, supply chain screw-ups, or not screw-ups, uh, supply chain aftermath of COVID. You have inflation, you have political tension in the United States, the likes of which we haven't seen for, for what, quite a while. Um, surely the 1920s can't recover and boom that the way that the 19, uh, the 2020s can't recover in the way that the 1920s, could they? Well, I don't know. Let's go through some of the problems. Big problems, supply, labor shortages, inflation is everywhere, though coming down, I'll get more to the, uh, on that in a bit. China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. Um, COVID clearly um, really inflicted some major damage on some major civil institutions, K through 12 education being one of the top ones, uh, public uh, or uh, college education uh, in many ways too. We have uh, the climate's not getting any uh, better. I mean, you can be, you can place yourself wherever you want on the climate spectrum, but wherever you are on the climate spectrum, whether you're really worried about it or not worried about it so much, almost nobody on that spectrum would say that, yes, it's getting better. Um, it's getting worse. It's just a matter of how, uh, how severe that is. And then you have energy. Um, Europe faces severe shortages and recession this winter. A few more details on that to come. But I mean, where is the recession going to land in the world? I think the U.S. is sort of going to tiptoe by it, barely. But Europe is going to suffer, I think, the equivalent of almost a depression this winter. So it's a little more on that. So these are really round, rough numbers. For official numbers, check with Sadiq or somebody who studies this on a level of detail, I don't. But just using round, round numbers, the global economic output is about $105 trillion in 2022 dollars. Uh, the US is about $25 trillion nominally. China is about $20 trillion, And the EU is about $20 trillion. So just, you know, are these the most accurate numbers? No. Are they r roughly right? They're good enough for uh, w the points that I'm going to attempt to make here. China. Okay, China is, you know, the size of the EU coming up on the size of the United States. What happens in China affects the global economy, and it affects the U.S. economy. So what's going on in China? Very little good. Uh, zero COVID took China's uh, annual growth figures from, you know, I mean, China, it was impossible that China was going to grow 8, 9, and 10% forever because you can't grow off of that, off of the big numbers that the economy is. But they were growing, you know, at 5 and 6% before COVID hit. And then, in my opinion, some of these self-inflicted uh, damages that China's done with its near zero growth or zero COVID policy, which has recently lifted. But the aftermath of a couple years of zero COVID policies has taken China's growth down. It'll be about 2% this year. If, you're in, if you live in China, 2% feels like a depression to you. I mean, this is a country that um, its whole self-esteem, its whole uh, mythology about itself really in large part derives from this economic miracle that they've had over the last 30 years. President Xi, who was really uh, crowned leader for life at the 20th Party Congress in late October, doesn't really believe that. He's more ideological than Deng Xiaoping and all the people who brought economic reform. In fact, at the Party Congress, um, he praised the spirit of 1949 13 times in his opening remarks. Now, what's 1949? That's when the People's Republic of China was born. It came after the China Civil War, 46 to 49, where um, Mao's forces uh, chased uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek into Formosa or Taiwan as we know it, and that was the birth of the PRC. Well, when you're celebrating the birth of the PRC, you are really celebrating hardcore Marxist, Leninist, you know, ways of organizing the country. And so it's kind of, um, I understand, you know, that at a party congress, you're gonna praise the birth of the party and birth of the nation. And a lot of it was for domestic consumption, but it sure seemed that uh, there was a lot of praise for 1949 and very little praise for 1978 when Deng Xiaoping took over and set China on this course of market reform. Between 1949 and, 19, and Mao's death in 1976, by the way, 
something between 30 and 50 million Chinese either were starved or put to death. So to praise 1949 and that whole era is an absolute travesty, at least from uh, my Western eyes. Uh, there are no reformers on the new Politburo. They're all loyal to President Xi. Hu Jintao's re, uh, re, symbolic removal was really a disgrace. Um, got a photo of that. And then China is aging five months per calendar year. The, the, this has never happened that a country that size is getting as old as China is. So right on the press, right on the cusp of when China had accomplished 30 years of growth and all of these miracles, for reasons that are hard for a Westerner to understand, they seem to be uh, walking away from it. But maybe there's a hint um, that they are going to um, put a little uh, reversal on that and, and start welcoming and reform. We'll see about that. That was Hu Jintao uh, being removed at the 20th Party Congress last month. Um, look at that. I mean, that just, that's, uh, particularly in a culture where uh, face and face saving is so big, that's just about the biggest insult that you could give to anybody um, short, of, uh, short of death. This is a New York Times story. Two weeks ago, China's business elite see the country that let them thrive slipping away. Um, this is a really exhaustive, well-reported, uh, terrific article. If you, can, if you subscribe to the Times, or even if you don't, just Google it. Um, it's a really important article to understand what's going on in China. The, 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 the one shining light that makes me think that even uh, President Xi has gone as far as he's going to go on reinstituting Mao, Maoism is that he's quietly eased the COVID curbs. And it could be that a lot of this sort of pro-Maoism that we've been getting from him was for internal consumption and quietly uh, he knows that his country is headed for a bad, bad place if they continue at 2% growth. The internal dissent inside of China is going to become impossible to suppress if the country doesn't grow five or six percent, simply because those are the expectations that Chinese people have based on the last 30 years of an economic miracle. So 2023's big question is, I don't think, it, I don't think it's US centric. If you were to pick one big question in the world that's gonna affect the global economy, including the US, it will be, is China, will she quietly institute reforms like pulling back from the zero COVID policy and get China back to four to 5% GDP growth. If that happens, there are a lot of knockoff effects. I think both good and bad. I mean, uh, there'll be a commodity boom. That means commodities are gonna be more expensive from energy to copper and, and all the key minerals uh, that run the digital economy today. But it also means that supply, chain, um, supply chains will probably heal faster if China's back in the game. And that will have a somewhat deflationary effect um, with more supply coming online. So I think if you're gonna pick one thing to watch in the global economy and away from the United States, it will be can China get back to four to five percent growth is as she signaled, you know, sort of like, uh, I guess, uh, tantamount to our own Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell, who's talking a really tough game but is going to start easing back, I think, is did President Xi just talk a really tough Marxist game, but behind the scenes, now that he's leader for life, he's going to loosen the reins and let the entrepreneurs um, uh, give, have more territory. The EU is the biggest trouble spot in the world right now. The Russian gas cutoff uh, tip, well, has already tipped the EU into recession. It could be a depression-like recession this winter. High energy sh or energy shortages, high costs, out migration of manufacturers, angry farmers in Holland, yellow vests in France, low birth rates, immigrant ghettos, uh, uh, largely Muslim communities are not assimilating at all in countries like France and Sweden. Um, and the median age is 43. Now, I'd kind of like to be 43 myself, but, um, but the median age, when the median age is 43, that's five years older than the United States. And it's a couple years younger than Japan, but it's an age where economic growth slows down because people become savers rather than spenders. And uh, they don't, you know, so there's a lot of reasons why um, 
uh, the, the economic activity begins to slow down from a GDP level when the median age of your uh, population goes into the 40s. So the EU, of all the trouble spots in the world from an economic standpoint, the EU is, is got the biggest set of challenges in my mind. Wholesale electricity prices in Germany rose from an average of 82 euros per megawatt hour in mid-2021 to 469 per megawatt hour in 2022. That's a 466% increase year over year in the cost of electricity. Germany is going to be hit hard. What, 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 along with Japan, what is undeniably one of the manufacturing world-class powerhouses in the world? It's Germany. What do those factories run on? They run on electricity. However the electricity is generated, they run on electricity. BASF, uh, the chemical plant, um, is, um, which uses as much energy as... Uh, or natural gas as Switzerland is rapidly seeking ways to get out of Germany. Some of the major automobile manufacturers, well, none of the major automobile manufacturers in Germany are expanding in Germany now. They're expanding in South Carolina, they're expanding in Eastern Europe, anywhere but Germany because of the escalating electricity costs. Um, in France, uh, the President Macron called for a 10% reduction in energy usage across France. He has the problem with the yellow vests, uh, the people who, you know, drive trucks and th so forth. Dutch farmers are in an uproar over plans to curb animal numbers, to cut nitrogen emissions, um, and uh, that isn't directly related to fuel prices, but sort of in the same, same general territory. So Europe's got a lot of problems right now. Uh, Liz Truss, um, this, this is a story from August. She, inher she inherits an economic nightmare. Okay, she was out after 45 days. You prop this is I'm I'm being needlessly. I was rooting for her because she came in and she you know she I thought she was going to be a supply side tax cutter and for some reason she got bullied out of you know these Reagan esque like positions and and threw in the towel to these kind of bureaucrat uh, you know uh, managers who. And, um, and resigned after 45 days, it became kind of an ongoing joke at her expense in, in Britain, where one of the papers said, uh, will she survive longer than this head of lettuce? Uh, and and the, the lettuce outlasted Liz Truss. So I, I think that was, I, it, it's funny, and I'm laughing because I'm a cruel guy, uh, but um, I really think it was it was a real tragedy for her and probably for the country too because I think she would have set them more on a Thatcher-like course. How is the U.S. doing? Well, as one of my uh, investor friends said, uh, we're the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry uh, when you look at the global economy today, which is actually, you know, a good thing to say. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a recession going forward. Um, I was just... Uh, we were, uh, we were, I was talking to Sandeep and we were talking, I think we've already had one. We've skirted on, and I think we're going to get very close to one again in 2023, but I don't think we're going to, um, I don't think we're going to sink into one. Inflation is waning um, slowly and now kind of rapidly. So I think the Federal Reserve is going to start getting a lot uh, more dovish. I think we're going to see maybe one more half point rate hike, and then they're going to wait and see. The producer price index, uh, the M2, uh, money supply, all of these things at the leading edge before they finally hit the consumer price index, which is the one you always read about, have been sinking uh, for quite some time, for a matter of months. And so the latest headlines are not shocking us on the inflation upside, I mean, on the inf on greater inflation than we inspected. Now the surprises are coming in the way we want them to. It looks like, um, it looks like the back of inflation has been broken. As um, people, new people rotate into the Fed, some of the people that will be rotating into the Fed in 2023 are known to be a little more dovish than hawkish. So we'll see. Uh, as one of my friends said, it, we're, the U.S. is the cleanest dirty shirt in the global laundry of economies now, so that's not a bad place to be. So we have, uh, so does this all say the 70s or the 1920s? 
Um, well, we still have a new world. Co COVID is fading into a seasonal flu. Technology is accelerating. Moore's law, which dictated the pace of how fast digital technology could progress, is not slowing down. It's actually speeding up for, for reasons that I can get into if we do a Q&A, but don't want to take up too much time of it here. Augmented reality is going to be a big winner. There, I think we'll see a profound revolution in healthcare, profound revolution in education, and we're seeing that the Silicon Valley culture of startups and venture capital is spreading outside of Silicon Valley. It has been for some time, but more and more places, yes, we all know about Austin, Texas. You should see what's going on in Columbus, Ohio, for example. The governor, Mike DeWine, um, and so there have been a migration of some Silicon Valley venture capitalists into Ohio. Uh, Columbus sees itself as the Austin of the Midwest. It's about the same population. It's also a state capital. About the only thing that it doesn't have that Austin has is South by Southwest and probably better barbecue. But this is a really ambitious state and the Silicon Valley model is spreading out. Investor caution. I would say that of all the promising technologies out there, these ones are slower to develop, uh, will be slower to develop than some of their um, promoters thought would happen, blockchain and crypto. I think uh, there are a lot more crypto fans six months ago than there are now. Uh, but you know who was never a crypto fan? Warren Buffett. Uh, Charlie Munger was never a crypto fan. In fact, at, the, at their big um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting in Omaha in May, they both through shade, major shade on crypto. A blockchain uh, upon which crypto is based, commercial quantum computing, um, the metaverse, the EV market growth, electric vehicle growth. Um, all of these are, I believe they're more 2030s technology. EVs are here, of course. Some of you may have them, some of you may be re ha really happy with them. But the kind of four uh, rapid take up growth, hockey stick growth for EVs, I don't believe it's going to happen. They face a tall hurdle. The Tesla Model 3, for example, has a battery weight of 1,000 pounds. It takes approximately 500,000 pounds of rock to extract the minerals needed for a single Tesla battery. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, there's simply no way around that with today's lithium-ion technology. There are uh, successor technologies um, that... that uh, uh, may um, reduce that mining load to create EV batteries. This is the most popular speaker at our Forbes Investor Cruises, uh, Mark Mills. Um, uh, he, uh, if you go to Real Clear Markets or Real Clear Politics, you'll often see a lot of Mark's, uh, Mark's work. He teaches at um, the, uh, Kellogg School, at Northwestern's Business School. He's got a PhD in chemical engineering, he combines a lot of business software and, and hard asset knowledge together to predict where the future is going. And this is what he, uh, this is like a, a five minute uh, clip uh, from an LA TV station where Mark is talking about why EVs are really promising, but not in this decade will they grow uh, in market share to the degree a lot of people will. So. Um, Watch this with an open mind. You may agree with him. You may not agree with him. He's a smart guy. I, I, I put it out this there. This is News Conference Extra Extra with Conan Nolan. Good morning and welcome to News Conference Extra, a special segment of Today in L.A. Weekend. I'm Conan Nolan coming to you from the NBC4 Newsroom. Recently, the governor of California has stepped up dramatically his effort at passing environmental regulations in the effort to fight climate change and global warming, particularly, of course, the work by the California Air Resources Board, which recently said that by 2035, all new cars in California cannot be gas powered. They have to be electric. In fact, the drawdown on gas powered cars starts in just a few years. Environmental groups have celebrated this as an effort to again fight global warming and climate change and get the state off oil. But a report out this week by the Manhattan Institute indicates that it simply may not be possible. Mark Mills is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a faculty fellow at Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science. So your report uh, seems to indicate that uh, it may be a laudable goal to get us off oil, but requiring electric vehicles won't get us there because of the way those electric vehicles are manufactured. 
It wouldn't matter what the reason is you don't want to use internal combustion engine cars. That has nothing to do with the fact the car uses lots of copper or lots of lithium, lots of nickel, lots of manganese, and lots of aluminum. That's how the cars are built when they're electric. The materials will have to be mined and produced to make the vehicles. We know for a fact today, it's not speculation, it's nothing to do with climate change, that the world's mining sector is not expanding enough. We, we aren't even planning to mine enough copper, one of the oldest metals known and mined by humankind, dates to prehistory. The world will be short roughly 2x, 200% less copper than it needs to meet uh, transition aspirations for electric vehicles and wind turbines and solar arrays. That That's going to present a problem. It'll be an economic problem. It'll be a practical problem. It's not a, a climate observation. It's a mining industrial supply chain fact. Based on its manufacturing, is there such a thing as, an, uh, as a zero emission vehicle? In a single electric vehicle, its battery weighs about a thousand pounds. You have to dig up about 500,000 pounds of rock to make the minerals for that one battery. Those are big mining machines operating on diesel fuel all over the world. It takes natural gas and coal to move and process all the rock into minerals. We do know for a fact that when an electric car is delivered to somebody's driveway, depending on where it was made and where the chemicals were processed, uh, that it arrives with roughly a 10 to 20 ton of cumulative emissions of CO2 before you drive it the first mile. Volkswagen and Volvo have both published studies like this at their websites, which are excellent studies, frankly, by being honest about the fact that you have to drive an electric Volkswagen about 60,000 miles before you break even with the carbon dioxide emissions from driving a regular Volkswagen. Is that a permanent condition? Well, no, but it's the condition the world is in today and will be in for, for at least a decade or two. And that means you are emitting carbon dioxide. It is one planet. It's just elsewhere. And it matters where the elsewhere is because China, it's relevant to note, has utter dominance in the processing of the minerals and chemicals and metals needed to make electric cars. In fact, they have a global market share in energy minerals roughly double OPEC's market share in oil. So if you, uh, if you want to... It goes on for a while, but I think you get the gist that, that um, what I've observed in my career living 30 years in Silicon Valley is a lot of things that can scale very rapidly in the digital world simply cannot scale that rapidly in the physical world. And so when you have electric vehicles, as an example, you have a lot of enthusiasts and a lot of bright minds who come from the digital world and assume that the, the gains in performance over cost will be somewhat akin to what can happen with personal computers or cell phones. And what Mark Mills is reminding us is that in the physical world simply cannot, just by its nature, evolve at the same rate that things in the digital world is. So just, you know, if you're an EV enthusiast, don't not be an EV enthusiast. I think as an investment, um, that the big EV days are still in front of us, and I don't mean next year or the year after that. There's probably, it's going to take lithium sulfur or some big um, evolutionary leap or two in battery technology to make it more scale scalable and affordable at the same time. Um, stock boom 2023. This is really interesting that uh, when you look at uh, the stock market performance over the last 100 years or so, you see that the, you know, the returns have been something like 8 or 9%, dividends included, somewhere in that. Again, I'm using fairly rough numbers. But when you, when you pair it away, you see that the year after a presidential election, so year one of somebody's administration, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, whether they are a, a, it's their first term as a president or their second term, Year one in, the, in, in an administration in a four-year term, um, the year after uh, is sort of below average market returns, 6.7%. Second year, even a little worse, uh, not even 6%. Third year, after the midterms, 16.3%, uh, and then fourth year, um, uh, below average again. So you get your 8 or 9%, whatever that is, by averaging out four years, but most of the gains, the big year is in year three. So, you know, is that uh, just an historic anomaly? You know, it, the, the data set isn't all that big uh, because we're going back about 100 years. So, 
you know, we've got 25 administrations, four-year periods to look at. But it is kind of an intriguing. And if there was a reason why the third year in somebody's administration, and that's the year that we're going to have in 2023, could be better than average and significantly so, is you have balance. Uh, whether, you know, whether the Democrats controlled everything or the Republicans controlled everything, Americans like balance and they also like a good bit of gridlock. Because when you, gridlock sounds bad, uh, but to investor it's kind of a good thing because gridlock produces predictability. You don't get these sweeping changes that are going to have these massive effects on portfolios that are going to take, you know, all, even the brightest minds, in, in investment minds in the world, uh, a good deal of time to figure out the impact of these major legislative or regulatory changes. So take it for what it is, but it's pretty dramatic when it stands out that when you look at that. And if you take that in combination with the fact that, in, that I think the Fed is going to be more dovish going forward, um, and um, there, there's this uh, economist named Scott Granis, G-R-A-N-N-I-S, um, look him up, um, uh, has some really good reasons why he thinks that the Fed is going to move toward a more dovish posture in 2023. That would be good for stocks too. So here are a couple scenarios. If you think stocks for the 2020s are going to be, uh, the rest of the 2020s will be in a, uh, let's call it a declining interest rate. Uh, interest rates are going down as they went down um, for, for a few decades uh, prior to what happened recently. And in a low inflation scenario, there are two areas I think that are, that are going to outperform, and that would be semiconductors, and that includes semiconductor equipment companies, and enterprise software. By enterprise software, I mean Microsoft, uh, IBM, um, you know, SAP, you know, com companies like that. So not consumer uh, companies, but, but enterprise companies that sell their software to, to other companies. They will do, um, they will do well. Um, they, uh, software is poised to grow globally anyway, but they will do good in a low interest environment. If you think we're gonna have a high interest rate, high inflation scenario, then you wanna be in energy and minerals. You know, it, Again, think in terms of that one or two or less than 5% of your portfolio that just for the fun of it, you might want to tinker with. Uh, so you can have interesting conversations with Tim and his team at Whittier Trust who are doing the lion's share of the work. You know, think, think about maybe, you know, think about, uh, you know, an, an S&P ETF with maybe loading a little more on, um, energy and minerals and a little more on semiconductors and enterprise software and see, see how you do. Final thought, never sell the U.S. short. Uh, we had a great uh, video that I um, has since expired of Warren Buffett at our Forbes 100th anniversary party in 2017 on why he never sells the U.S. short. But here is, just in terms of demographics, if you can't see this, I'll explain it to you. But the change in working age population from 1990 to 2019 um, so the 30 years, you know, just recently expired. You saw that the United States and China grew by 30, you know, over 30 percent working age population. Uh, France um, uh, under 10 percent. Germany actually went um, downhill. Uh, Italy uh, barely grew at all. Japan, of course, has had a population implosion because they don't, um, you know, immigrants aren't really welcome in Japan. Uh, Russia has had somewhat of a population implosion, but South Korea boomed. So there's a correlation between the booming economies and the, the, the growth in working age people. Okay, what's going to happen over the next uh, 30 years? The United States is the only one that's going to grow in that comparative set, 13%. Uh, China, that's where China's aging population really comes home to bite. Um, France, uh, you know, kind of keeps its head barely, well, not barely above water, but not so deeply submerged. Germany really goes into the tank. Italy also. Japan, which had been trending in that way, goes even more that way. Russia and South Korea completely flip-flops. This is important. So you think about um, where, where, where is the opposite happening? Well, it's happening in India and Southeast Asia. So that would be my final thought, is that, you know, if, if you... 
If you think semiconductors and enterprise software are, are going to be, these are growth markets, they'll just get higher valuations in a, low, um, in a low interest rate environment than they would in a high interest rate environment. That's the nature of growth stocks. And you know, energy, uh, if the economy grows, and particularly if China gets back to four or 5% growth, they're gonna add to the global demand of energy and minerals, that's probably a good bet. But then if you think regionally, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I wanna, if I wanna experiment with having ETFs in different countries, you know, which countries would I wanna be in? I would wanna be in Southeast Asia, the, you know, the biggest country is Indonesia. Um, Singapore is kind of the banking capital of, of, of the ASEAN countries and India, and then certain countries in Africa. Um, well, that's all I have to say. You've been very generous with your time. I'll let Tim um, govern whether, or Brandy govern whether, Brandy, uh, whether we want to do Q&A, or, uh, or you want to cut now, or however you want to do it. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if you see inflation, maybe on the downward slide, uh, where do you see interest rates? I, I think in, what I'm seeing is that um, some of the leading indicators of CPI inflation, consumer price index inflation, um, two of them that are really important would be the producer price index and the other one would be the M2 money supply. The producer price index actually peaked in the spring this year and it's been coming down, so it's running um, Probably Sadiq has better numbers than I do, but it's running more in the realm of 5% or 6% versus the consumer price index, which is between that and 10. Uh, the, M2, the growth in M2 money supply has been coming down for several months, and the absolute M2 money supply is now beginning to come down too. You look at what's go you look at the uh, what's going on in housing markets and all the you know previously heated housing markets around the country. And then, and then the, the odd one is the strength of the dollar. I mean, the, sometimes it, it, at our global CEO conference in Singapore, we nicknamed the conference the new abnormal, you know, because we're seeing sort of these anomalies that you don't really see. You don't really see, you know, in the 70s when we had inflation, we had a weakening dollar. Um, you know, people would, that would travel to Europe were just appalled at how expensive things were in the 1970s when they got outside of the United States. Conversely, people from Europe came to the United States and it was like, you know, Christmas morning, you know, when you were a little kid. Uh, everything seemed so cheap. So when you, look at, uh, when you look at those factors, the strength of the dollar, the falling of housing prices, um, M2, the growth of M2 having come down for months, M2 is a raw number coming down finally. Um, and then, uh, you know, you add it all up, you'd say, you, you'd have to believe that the, that the leading edge of inflation, or, or, or the, the back of inflation has been broken. About the only thing that's keeping it up, and I'd love to hear from Sadiq, who follows this closer than I do and directly impacts what your trust and investment thinking, but, um, Labor supply is still the sticky, is still the sticky one here. Um, I think that a lot of the labor supply, um, I think that's sort of a post-COVID adjustment period. Um, uh, there are many, many factors that might be going into that. But I think, I think that inflation, inflation is going to trend down. Uh, will, it, will it get to Jerome Powell's goal of 2%? I don't know, maybe he'll change his mind and say three or 4% is good enough and declare victory. But, but um, the, the sort of nine and 10% figures that we saw a few months ago have slowly been receding into 7% figures and I'm using CPI. So I think the, the leading edge of CPI is coming down, which is why I think the Fed will be, um, I think they'll, we'll get another, uh, we'll get uh, maybe a quarter point or a half point hike coming up and then they're gonna take a pause. Uh, the, the, then they'll take a pause on further, further hikes. So I think we'll wind up somewhere around four and a half to five percent for the Fed funds rate. Great, question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Could I ask you to backtrack a little bit? You mentioned in passing that Moore's law 
has been superseded at twice the rate. I, I haven't seen that trickle down to like computer prices and chips and stuff. And be just to know, uh, have you expand on that? Yes. Um, how many? How many know generally what Moore's law is? What? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we're blessed that we live in California because I think we see trends of all kinds uh, in advance of others. But Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductor and later Intel. But, um, and he was the chief technology officer at Intel and sort of the guy who really understood what was going on at the chip level. And he made this notation in 1965 in an electronics magazine that his industry the new semiconductor industry, which is only about a six-year-old industry at the time, seven-year-old industry, was able to put twice as many transistors in the same, you know, area of a silicon chip as they had been uh, two years before. And therefore, this doubling of density, he, he thought it would run out, um, but, it, but it really hasn't run out. And so you get, you know, you get 30 and 40 billion transistors on a, on a silicon chip today. The Intel first microprocessor was called the 4004, named after the number of transistor equivalents on a piece of silicon. So that's been this amazing rate of progression. In economic terms, it is translated roughly to, at the same performance point, prices will drop about 30% per year if unimpeded by other things you know, shortages here or, or whatever. So that's why, um, you know, the iPhone you have in your pocket or the Samsung Fold phone is probably equivalent to an Intel 486. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just being sort of loose and round with my numbers, but, but, but roughly say like, a, you know, the best personal computer you could have bought 20 years ago. Um, so you don't, always get, you don't always get the gains in price drops you get it in performance gains and maybe the price stays the same. Okay, well that's, that's been an amazing thing. The whole digital economy, all the complex software like artificial intelligence and everything, the metaverse, you know, all depends on these further gains because it takes that kind of horsepower uh, to run those really incredibly rich algorithms. It's, it's a little bit of a trick to say that Moore's Law has been superseded because on the, on the silicon chip, it hasn't. But what Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, and uh, Scott Guthrie, the president of uh, Microsoft Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud uh, computing offering, have said is that when you, it's the confluence of all the technologies out there. It's the confluence of what's happening on the silicon chip. It's the number of people who are connected on the internet, which is its own dynamic. It's what's happening in wireless bandwidth, going from 3G to 4G to 5G, and you add it all up. It's the add it all up, and you get something, a rate of progression that is faster. So that's why, um, that's why we frankly get excited about artificial intelligence and the metaverse and some of these things, but, but, but we have a pattern of getting ahead of ourselves. In fact, the, the big research firm Gartner, the Gartner Group, has something called the Gartner Hype Cycle about technologies. You'll read about a technology, you'll get all excited about it, artificial intelligence, the metaverse, blockchain, 3D printing, and it gets hyped to death, and overinvestment bids up the, you know, the price of investing in the space at, at, at the venture capital level, and then the hype goes away. This is what's happening in crypto right now. There's a crypto winter, uh, a blockchain winter. And then, um, then while you're not looking, if it's a legitimate technology, it kind of comes back. You know, so the hype cycle goes up, it goes down, and you want to you know, you catch it before. You don't want to catch it at the top as an investor because you overpay for it. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, if I if I understand you, I mean, crypto uses blockchain technology, uh, which is sort of a digitized ledger 
um, that everybody know, you know, everybody can go back and look at the legitimacy of, of something and what was traded when. If I'm probably bastardizing that definition, but there are other forms of blockchain. So an example would be, um, I interviewed not long ago, the uh, a guy named um, Jim Hageman Snaba, who used to be the co-CEO of SAP. And, um, and he just goes by Jim, Jim Snob now, but he was, after leaving SAP a few years ago, he was the chairman of Maersk, uh, the Danish shipping company, which is the largest container shipping company in the world. And I thought this is really interesting. You're going from software, uh, the world of bits, into the world of atoms, one of the heaviest footprint industries on planet Earth, which is container shipping. You know, what... what how do these two things come together? And he, and he said, um, he said, imagine an avocado growing in New Zealand that winds up on a store shelf in Hong Kong, or Mexico that winds up on a store shelf here. But, but he was using one with a little more shipping involved. New Zealand to Hong Kong for an avocado, and it's a dollar on the shelf. He says, how much do you think? And I did this interview in the spring when energy costs were, were pretty high. They had been going up for quite a while. He said, how much of that dollar do you think is uh, the energy cost of shipping? I said, I don't know, 25 cents? He says, it's less than you think. It's nine cents, round it off, 10 cents. A tenth of the cost, you know, getting that avocado from the farm to, um, to a store shelf in Hong Kong, 10% is the fuel cost of, of the ship and the trucks and all that kind of stuff. He says, now, how much do you think is attributable to paperwork? 20%, 20% uh, because at every, at every stop along the way, somebody has to fill out a bunch of forms um, to verify that the avocado was really grown at this farm in New Zealand, you know, and it's, it, it's not rotten, and it's not carrying, it's not, you know, it wasn't over, doesn't have too many pesticides and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and that just slows everything down. It adds to the price of the avocado. And that's where I think blockchain can be the, the difference maker. So I think blockchain um, will have utility um, outside of cryptocurrency. The other place where I think it might have utility is in, um, you, you've probably all read about this trend, that because college education costs have gone up so much, number one, and because it's really, no matter how you say it, you know, it really sort of discriminates from people of, um, you know, poor economic backgrounds who, you know, don't, they don't get the SAT coaching, they don't get, you know, they, they may not even realize they're as smart as they are, you know, that there are opportunities that are in front of them that could be stuff that nobody in their family has ever seen. So, you know, you're going to have, uh, I think, on the margin, but, but it's a growth industry, is you'll have certificates of learning will become more important than college degrees. Uh, and probably in many fields like medicine, it'll be both. You know, we, I kind of want an MD to do my brain surgery, but I also want that MD, you know, doing my brain surgery to be provably really current. And that sort of certificate of learning and the provability of, um, of learning, uh, it, you know, is someplace where blockchain could really shine, you know, that this person is who they say they are. So I think that there are, I, I think that just sort of, uh, in supply chains, particularly in, you know, um, life and death products like medicine and agriculture and in, in uh, education, blockchain could be big. I just don't think it's going to be in the first half of the 2020s. I think it's one of those technologies like rapid scalability of EVs or me the metaverse. Um, you know, we already have a, the metaverse sort of in the business world. They're called digital twins. I mean, that is, you know, you have a supply chain and you have a digital depiction of that supply chain. The truck is over here, the ship is over there, the product's over there. We're watching it almost like a game. I mean, if that isn't the metaverse, I don't know what the metaverse is. Uh, it's actually a metaverse that has some utility rather than these really dorky figures created in his own image by Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Rich. Okay. Uh, five minutes ago, I thought I had a real good question, but I think you've answered it. Um, it's about crypto, and the first question is, you did a great job comparing the 1920s to where we are today and what that has taught us and what may still happen. Um, 
Why would you name a company where people bury the dead in the first place? Because it seems to be living itself out with crypto. My question is, what would you look at crypto today that might have been thought to be a good idea than a bad idea that did evolve to a good idea? True or false? Well, a lot of the most fascinating technologies that we know today started out with a different use in mind. I mean, um, my, my friend and mentor, George Gilder, who really, he, he pretty much talked Steve Forbes into hiring me 30 years ago, um, you know, is on record as saying the most consequential product of the 20th century. And there would be a lot of contenders here. Um, but, but in his mind, it was the microprocessor. At least the second half of the 20th century, maybe along with genetic engineering, were the, sort of the two things that change the world as we know it today. Well, the microprocessor was developed for um, a Japanese calculator company called Bizicom. Uh, and when that was developed, when the, micro, when the microprocessor was released by Intel in November 1971, personal computers were still way out there, or out, the hobby computers shortly followed in the mid-70s, you know, and then Apple was started in 76, and the, but the IBM personal computer, you, you know, didn't come out until 1980 or 81. Or you think of, uh, you think of uh, one of the most... Um, consequential semiconductor companies in the world today, N NVIDIA. And NVIDIA was really a supercharged way for uh, super, how to supercharge your personal computer for the gamer community. And then it just turns out that all the attributes that make it work in, in NVIDIA's graphic processors are the very things that drive artificial intelligence software engines. So there are a lot of those kind of examples out there where something can be hype to not find its traction right away, and maybe it finds traction in a different place. Could be the blockchain finds it in education. Could be it finds it in um, the development and shipping of pharmaceuticals or, or the growing and shipping of agricultural products where you really want to know the provenance of, you know, of, of those products so that you don't get a, a fake or something that is uh, bad for your health. So. Um, it's endlessly uh, fascinating to be, that's why, think about that 2%, two, 2%. I'm going to go to 2%. Um, be a 2% self-investor if you're not, because it's the best way to keep up with global events. And um, you'll have much to talk about with your Whittier Trust advisor. Um, you can, uh, and it's and just a ball to me. So thank you so much for your uh, time and attention tonight. Okay, um, anyway, I just want to thank you guys for coming and one final housekeeping item. So we have these lovely centerpieces that we would like someone at your table to take home. So I'm going to task you guys with finding out who has the birthday closest to Christmas. So chat around and then whoever has the closest birthday, please take the centerpiece and enjoy it. Thank you guys for coming. Drive safe.